Yo, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Simply Bitcoin IRL. Today, we have a very special guest. We have Saifedean Amos. He is the author of the Bitcoin standard, the fiat standard, and also the newly released work, The Principles of Economics. I'm really excited to chat with him today. But before we jump into the show, I want to give a shout out to the Bitcoin company that makes this show possible. Swan Bitcoin, the best place to build your Bitcoin stack. It's being built by by Bitcoiners. It's for Bitcoiners. They incentivize dollar cost averaging. They incentivize self-custody. And also check out their new product, the Swan IRA. Swan offers both traditional and Roth options to best fit your needs. This is real Bitcoin, not ETF or other derivative. Get the real thing and get it at Swan. Build your legacy your way. Go to swan.com slash IRA for more details. And of course, if you need questions, doubts, or concerns, you can always hit me up on Twitter DM or or the Orange Pill app. All right, guys, no more delay. Let's jump straight into the show. All right, everybody. Uh, today, I'm deeply honored, honestly, to have uh, Saifedean Amus on uh, Simply Bitcoin IRL today. And uh, man, your work, I, I think looking, looking, you know, 10 years into the future, your work is going to be looked at as some of the most consequential writings, um, especially since we're transitioning into this new era of, of, of economics, or better said, this new era of the role in which governments play in people's lives. And I think that you were, you were one of the first to kind of really identify this. And perhaps maybe you call this a, a metaphor or a sign, but the Bitcoin standard is actually thinner than the fiat standard. And I think that really <laughs> represent, I think it says a lot um, in, in just that. And maybe I'm wrong in observing that. Maybe the text is bigger, the pages are bigger, but it's almost as if it's it was more difficult to explain the fiat standard than the Bitcoin standard. No, that's absolutely correct. Uh, Bitcoin is a lot simpler than fiat. I mean, people think Bitcoin is complicated. And generally, uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. But yeah, you're correct. Um, uh, Bitcoin, I mean, I wrote the Bitcoin standard first. And for most people, it's extremely difficult to understand Bitcoin because, you know, what is this weird money? How can it work without a central bank in charge? How can it work without a bunch of criminal sociopaths who get to print it to finance mass murder? Clearly, you can't have money like that. And so it's very difficult for them to get their heads around the idea that you can just have uh, computer code do the job of money, but you can, and that's what Bitcoin does. So explaining Bitcoin from scratch was pretty challenging, I must say. Um, and I, but I sat down and I buckled down and I wrote it, and I glad to see that it seems to have worked out well. A lot of people like the book. It's been translated to thirty six languages so far. But then, uh, then you know, the idea came to me that maybe I should just do the same thing with fiat because, like, um, maybe the most interesting parts of Bitcoin were not so much about Bitcoin itself, in as much as it is about the current fiat system and how it works and why it is so massively dysfunctional. And I thought, yeah, maybe if we explain that from scratch, then we can get a whole lot of um, insight into how the fiat system works. And so I sat down and tried to explain that. And actually, it was harder. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, Bitcoin is code. You run your node, and then everybody runs their node. And so it's a, it's, it's a pretty contained um, problem attack surface um, where you just uh, understand how the node runs, understand how the code runs, how people use it, and then, bam, you get it. But with fiat, it's a lot more complicated than that. You've got an enormous, enormous world of... Um, all kinds of different institutions that have been built over a century all over the world, interacting with one another, uh, political and economic and uh, financial institutions, all um, being run in certain ways. And, you know, in order to try and explain it, you know, you have to kind of, kind of step back from it. And so for me, it was a little bit like um, somebody visiting an alien civilization and trying to make sense of what these people are doing you know imagine i'm, I'm trying to step out, like a fish trying to step out of the water and trying to describe the water to the rest of the fish from the perspective of something that's outside the water 
And it's actually pretty startling, you know, just because we're used to it, because we're always around this water all the time, does not mean that this is good water. <laughs> it does not mean that it's run in a good way. And the, you know, the more that you study it, the more that you look at it, the more you see there are so many things that are wrong with it. And um, it's a system that uh, is ripe for destruction, I would say. A hundred percent. And, and you know, it's really interesting that the way that you, that you framed it, right? So uh, safe and... I, you know, I, I, I started my career around 23, 24, and I actually did the exact opposite. I understood Bitcoin um, before I understood or tried to learn and understand the traditional financial system. So like, it's like this like backwards process where I'm like looking back and you know, and, and and I'm forced to learn it. If you have like people like Greg Foss or like Lawrence Lepard coming on the show and like Lynn Alden, I'm like, I don't want to sound like a moron. Like I don't want to sound like an idiot. So I'm like, okay, I have to, I have to learn some types of these things. But once you go down that rabbit hole, and you know, the Fiat Standard, the book that you wrote, played a very key role in in my understanding of this. I'm looking at, I'm looking back at this, and I'm like, how are people okay with this? This is absolutely insane. Because most people, you were mentioning, you were mentioning it earlier, they've lived their entire life in what I call the fiat matrix, right? And then they're transitioning to a Bitcoin standard versus I think the younger generations, as as in my case, right, kind of went from a Bitcoin standard, you know, had a little bit of exposure, had your bank account and whatever, but you know, all in Bitcoin 2016, haven't looked back ever since. And then looking back at that system, like, how how is there not a revolt on the streets the next day? This is absolute madness. This is pure theft. Um, I can't believe we live in this system where, you know, this bureaucratic elite have this ability to create money for free that the rest of us peasants and plebs have to work for. It's absolutely infuriating. And what scares me a little bit, Saifedean, is people are still asleep, you know, Thank God to your efforts, which is why I'm, you know, so honored to have you on the show today. You, you're playing such an essential role because you have the ability and the academic background to really describe this. You know, like I could come up with little slogans here and there, but you actually put this on paper and you actually describe it. Um, so I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think you know the, the um, yeah. I I would imagine that most people actually share your journey. It's much more common to take your um, route, just because the vast majority of people, as you said, in the fiat system don't understand what's going on. They're born into it, and so they just continue to use it. Only when you step out um, by going into Bitcoin are you able to examine what was going on there, and then you can look at it, and then you can understand how terrible it is. So I'd imagine that uh, we're going to see this become a more common feature that people who get into Bitcoin understand fiat after having understood Bitcoin. Because, and, and again, this was the motivation of the book. Like Once you understand how Bitcoin works, you see, here's a payment network that functions all over the world. It's been going for 14 years and it's software. So it's basically the most basic and essential building blocks. It's the bare bones of a working uh, monetary and financial system. So this is what you need. So then you can analogize it to ev other um, more um, elaborate, sophisticated, complicated, scammy um, alternatives like the fiat system. And then you can see clearly how the fiat system works, why it works in a certain way that it does. And that, I think, is going to be more common than, you know, the Greg Fosses and the Lawrence Leopards, who are in a tiny minority of being in the, you know, before they got into Bitcoin, they already understood how messed up uh, fiat really was. Um, but I think uh, the good news, in a sense, uh, is that um, it doesn't even matter. I mean, it's good that people want to learn about fiat. So because they buy my book and, you know, please do buy my book. Um, but uh, I have kids to feed. But uh, ultimately, it kind of doesn't matter. This is the great thing about Bitcoin. And this is where I, I you know, I, I, I could sound a little jarring to a lot of people. Because for me, we don't need to teach people anymore. We don't need people to learn. <laughs> we just need... We just have, as long as we have number go up technology, as I like to call it, then 
we no longer have to appeal to people's good side. We can just rely on their self-interest. And that's really the thing that makes the difference. So a hundred years ago, there were people who understood just how much of a disaster it would have been to go off the gold standard. In fact, in 1914, you know, the central banks themselves, they did not say we're going off the gold standard. It took essentially 56, 57 years until 1971 for them to uh, actually go off the gold standard. During that time, the Overton window was slowly shifted from the gold standard is great, the gold standard is the best, but we need to take a little bit of a time off because we have evil enemies we want to kill in this war. And if we don't do it, then they're going to win the war and they're going to destroy us. And then slowly and slowly and slowly over time, thanks to the work of uh, criminals like uh, John Maynard Keynes and the um, economic academic establishment and the media and bank PR departments, which, well, it's the same thing. Economics uh, education is bank PR departments. But with that, you know, you saw the Overton window shift slowly. So in the 1930s, uh, that uh, disgusting pedophile uh, Keynes comes along and then he posits that, hey, you know, just like we got off the gold standard and won the world war, we can do the same thing and fix the unemployment problem. And then, um, you know, we're, we do deficit spending for a while, but then uh, we'll, we'll get back to running uh, surpluses in the good times. We just need the deficit spending to get out of the rut in which we are. And then once we sort things out, then we don't need deficit spending anymore. But the Overton window continued to shift that by 1971, a significant enough majority of people, um, uh, and you know, by that time, universities and the media had been completely co-opted and turned into retarded zombies, if you'll excuse my French, who just went along. So actually, when uh, Nixon announced that gold is uh, that the dollar is no longer redeemable for gold. Uh, the media and the academics, they all said, wow, what a genius, brilliant idea, you know, that this is going to solve everything. It took 56 years from 1914 and the suspension of redemption of gold in the Bank of England, well, 1914-15, to 1971 for this to go from a bad thing to a good thing, but it happened. But all along, from 1914 to 1971 until today, there are always fiat people who, you know, were, were from within the fiat system who opposed this and thought, no, we need to go on the gold standard. This is going to be dangerous. And they spoke at length about it and they published books and they uh, got on the radio and they got on the TV. They got on the Internet and they ran for election and they got into Congress, some of them. But ultimately, it didn't matter because uh, that's really... It's, it's, it's like a short circuit of human civilization where human civilization relies heavily on a monetary system, as I discuss in my new book, Principles of Economics. It's inextricable part of a capitalist society that you need a monetary system, you need money. You can't have capitalism, you can't have division of labor, and you can't have any of the nice modern things that we take for granted in the world if we don't have a functioning monetary system. You know, just look at a country that's going through hyperinflation where there's no alternative to their currency and you see that everything is falling apart. But um, we go from having that being a useful thing to it being completely undermined and completely destroyed. And we witness the civilization fall apart, essentially we're witnessing it unravel. And yet, People aren't going to figure it out because, as I was saying, it's a short circuit of this uh, system. And so the people that are benefiting from the money printing, the people that are benefiting from the destruction of the monetary system are the ones who are in charge of it. So it's 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 a real, real, real technical problem because you know you get it it gets hijacked and it doesn't get hijacked by an enemy who's just trying to destroy it it gets hijacked by the person who's in charge of it you know the 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 uh, wolf in charge of the hen house or whatever the expression is and so of course they have a very strong vested interest in staying in charge of the hen house and that's where we find ourselves that's why politically it's a dead end to try and convince voters that hey the way to fix the economy is that I need to get in office and take away all the nice things that all the other corrupt sons of bitches have been giving you. And I'm going to take away all of your candy. I'm going to take away all of your pink ponies. And I'm going to take away all the nice things that you've been um, 
getting bribed with over the past century in order to sign off on your enslavement. Wake up, you're being enslaved, and you're being enslaved with your consent because you're being scammed, because you're being uh, forced to use a horrible uh, monetary system. It's a dead end. It can't work. They have the printer. They can propagandize better than you can. They can buy votes better than you can. So it's almost a dead end. And honestly, um, before Bitcoin, I understood most of the stuff, but I couldn't get myself to write about it because, you know, for me, like, what am I going to add to what people like Rothbard and Hayek and Mises have already written? To what, what can I add to what somebody like Ron Paul, who's been doing this stuff for decades, uh, is saying? There really wasn't much. And if those people couldn't get through, what chance did I have? You know, some random nobody, um, university professor. Um, why would people listen? And uh, that was pretty dispiriting. But then Bitcoin comes along and now it doesn't even matter. Now I write, um, you know, it's it's not that my writing, this is where I kind of I disagree with you. It's not that it is my writing that is making people shift to Bitcoin. I think it's rather that it is uh, Bitcoin that is attracting people to shift to Bitcoin because of number go up technology, because of self-interest. And then once they shift it there, then they become interested and curious to learn about it. And that's what creates demand for learning about this. So I'd much rather that it be this way, honestly, because it's um, it's much better to fight a winning war than a losing war. It's much better to be uh, um, to be rowing with the tide rather than rowing against the tide. And this is really what it comes down to. So don't beat yourself too up. Uh, don't beat yourself up too hard about the fact that everybody is, uh, well, not everybody, but most of our people are completely brainwashed with this stuff because it doesn't matter. Um, they're going to just simply understand the simple idea that if you stay in fiat, you get robbed. If you stay in Bitcoin, you manage to keep your wealth. And that, I think, is the, uh, that that's the real marketing that uh, Bitcoin does. Well, Sounds superficial. Yeah, it sounds superficial. It sounds, you know, how dare you be in it for the material gains? You know, we're supposed to be virtue signaling about um, inclusion and minorities and, you know, people in Africa. And of course, all of that stuff is true. But really, that's not going to get us anywhere. Telling people, hey, you should use Bitcoin because it's good for the poor, because it's better for uh, not to have inflation. That's not going to get us anywhere. If that could get us anywhere, people would have already moved to the gold standard. We have number go up technology. That's what it comes down to. That's what that that's the winning card in our uh, hand. Yep, that's that's definitely the ace up our sleeve. And you you were talking about it. You're saying that we're winning, and I completely agree. And we actually covered this um, a couple of days ago, or you know, a, a week or two ago. And I think it was a very historic moment. And you were you were mentioning about how the fiat cartel has basically, you know, every single world government has total um, total control over the, the types of uh, 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 economy, uh, uh, the economic theories that are taught, right? It's this to it's totally co-opted by um, by Keynesian economics. Well, uh, Saifedean, we have a beachhead now and that beachhead is the country of El Salvador. When I saw this, I got you know, shivers. And the reason for that is you have a nation state who is embracing um, Austrian economics, but it's not just Austrian economics like you mentioned, right? Because Austrian economics has been tried and tried and tested, right? But it seems like people don't, don't really listen. It's Austrian economics with a Bitcoiner in the mix. And you, uh, you know, you were invited to be the economic advisor uh, to the national Bitcoin uh, national Bitcoin office of El Salvador, so now we have an Austrian economist giving advice to a nation state. Holy cow! Um, are things going to change? And it makes perfect sense why the IMF has their panties in a bunch of it and they're freaking out the way they are. The fiat the fiat the fiat cartel is absolutely terrified. So what was that experience like in El Salvador? And, you know, of course, I'm I'm looking at this like from a third, uh, uh, from a from a bird's eye view, looking outside in. But from a historical perspective, 
uh, safe. This is this is insane. I don't think this has happened, right? I, I don't think uh, Austrian economists have been taken seriously on a nation state level. Um, I'm extremely bullish about that. Uh, what, what was that experience like with with uh, with uh, President Bukele? Did he approach you? How did you feel uh, when you know when that happened? Um, I, I I think it's great. Uh, I, I'm very excited about this. I think El Salvador in general, you know, putting aside the Bitcoin stuff, e even ignoring Bitcoin, um, just uh, El, El Salvador is an extremely exciting country that is truly bucking the trend. And, um, you know, I'm an anarchist. I'm extremely cynical and I'm always... Um, um, I'm, I'm always very cynical about the idea that a government can do anything good. In my mind, the only good thing that governments can do is just get out of the way and not do anything. But this thing comes along, the, you know, the news about El Salvador is just day after day, they're constantly um, proving themselves to be truly different from what most other countries are uh, like and most other governments are like so of, of course the uh, security issues is what's most startling which you know is uh, as i get older and i have a family this becomes more and more of something that you care about and you become concerned about you know the safety of your kids to walk down the street and of course over the last 10 years i think the world has just gotten a lot less safe 10 20 years the world's been progressively getting less and less safe pretty much everywhere you know crime continues to rise more and more particularly in the us and in the west and then to find a country that not only reverses the trend but almost completely um destroys the crime there is is absolutely mind blowing so it is an extremely exciting country and I should say, you know, we're not yet at the point where Bitcoin has made a difference in El Salvador's economy yet. It's still, um, it's, it's still a tiny part of the government's uh, cash balance. It's still, uh, you know, the penetration of the use of Bitcoin is still tiny in terms of the hands of people. So it isn't Bitcoin that has made the difference so far, but it is a Bitcoiner that has made the difference. I think this is the really key point. It's a Bitcoiner that has, you know, the, the, the kind of leadership that can uh, take on the gangs and win is also the kind of leadership that can look around and understand that, yeah, between uh, continuing to be essentially a bag holders for the US-based uh, banking cartels and continuing to use our country as just essentially slave labor to, to have our people continue to work for a money that uh, foreigners can print um is not as good of a deal as just you know <laughs> having our own uh, uh having an independent currency that is not controlled by anybody that nobody else can print so i think this is really exciting i'm i'm massively excited about the potential and the possibility and this is why you know i i'm i'm um i'm doing this job for free i'm not uh, getting paid for it because i really am excited about being part of this and i'm quite optimistic about it um, the way it came about, really, it was Max and Stacy. Like everything in the Bitcoin world, it all starts with Max and Stacy, as always. Uh, so uh, Max and Stacy have moved to El Salvador. They, uh, uh, they, they, they're helping the Bitcoin office there. They're also working there pro bono. They uh, like working in that office, and they're really doing everything that they can to boost the Bitcoin experiment there. And uh, it was Stacy who kept on insisting, you know, you need to come and visit. And so I came after the Miami conference. I went to El Salvador. I visited. Um, unfortunately, I did not have the time to be able to stay long because I had to get back home. I had uh, I have kids and a wife to um, tend to. So I could only stay there for a couple of days. I still did manage to get a good view of the country. Um, I went. I swam in the Pacific and I... Uh, climbed to a volcano and I saw, um, you know, obviously an empty volcano, not an active one. Uh, but I did get a nice view of the country. I walked around downtown. I spoke to people. There's an enormous positive air around um, the country there. People are just very excited about the fact that uh, they have a downtown again. They have streets. They can go play football in the streets. They can enjoy living life. They can enjoy the beautiful weather that they have almost year round. They can enjoy the amazing nature that they have and it's um it's 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 a great thing it's a, the, the entire country feels like a bunch of people who have been let out of prison and uh it was in a sense prison i mean everybody was basically stuck at home unless they really needed to go out the, the idea of just going out for leisure is was unheard of 
And so, you know, you, you look at the country, you walk around and you think, wow, this is truly beautiful. This is amazing. I mean, it's, it's, it's a tropical paradise, obviously, there. And then uh, you look at the kind of infrastructure that they have there, and it's obviously lacking in many ways. And then you obviously think, well, why is this place so underdeveloped? Obviously, the answer is because of the crime. You know, who's going to go and invest um, in restaurants or in um, factories or in businesses or in whatever it is when there's crime that's going to come after your workers, that's going to come after your customers? Obviously, such, you know, crime is going to severely handicap and paralyze the society when it comes to uh, being able to um, invest and think long term. And so you get rid of the crime and suddenly, you know, you can just see it. Yep, there's something missing now. Now that there's no crime, there's an economic 10x that needs to take place. And it's it looks like it's only a matter of time because, I mean, you know, the crackdown has been extremely effective and it doesn't look like the gangs can um, reassemble or mount any kind of serious uh, counteroffensive. Um, uh, and, you know... Perhaps if they manage to get some of the old political parties back in power, they might be able to do such a thing. But, um, you know, that doesn't look very likely. President Bukele's approval rating now has hit 93%. Basically, the only people that are not happy with him are the um, essentially the, the, the main beneficiaries of the two old political parties, which is basically like the Democrats and the Republicans, two oligarchies that... Uh, control all of the institutions of the country and uh, fight a civil war amongst themselves, sometimes with bullets and sometimes with boats and sometimes with rigged elections and with all kinds of uh, nasty things. But now it, it's it's astonishing. I mean, just imagine a third party candidate in the US running and uh, first of all, winning the election. You know, the, he runs for election, doesn't even go and attend the TV debates with the Republican and Democratic candidates. So I'm just imagine a third party candidate who says, no, you know, screw you. I'm not joining uh, Biden and Trump and or DeSantis or whatever in your debates. I'm not doing any of that stuff. And then he wins the election. And then the next year you have um, congressional elections. And then a new party that he establishes sweeps uh, the the electoral system and then they take over the political system and then the republicans and the democrats are reduced to essentially 20 or 30 percent of congress and um everybody hates them nobody wants them anymore it's just basically the establishment of the democratic and republican party that are still in um that are still clinging on to their old world and you know they're just um and it's so transparently self-serving because, you know, if you had a shred of honesty, you'd have to admit that, yeah, this guy's done a much better job than we ever could. Um, so it's truly exciting what's going on there. And I think um, the best is yet to come. I think uh, the president is likely to win re-election. And I think, you know, Bitcoin is likely to do its thing. And uh, we're going to get... And the price of Bitcoin going up is going to be massively positive for people in El Salvador because um, a lot of them have um, some Bitcoin. And I think, but, but what's more important, um, th th again, this 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 pisses off some Bitcoiners sometimes when I say it, but really the most important thing is how much Bitcoin we have in cash balances. And in the case of El Salvador, the most important thing is how much the government has because if the government can stack sats and the sats can go up in value and they keep get adding you know they keep stacking sats so the number of sats that they have goes up and then you know the price of the sats in dollar terms goes up then the government is witnessing its cash balance appreciate which i mean this might sound like it's an inconsequential detail uh, for um, people but for me this is this is this is as important as it gets because now you don't need to go to the capital markets you don't need to go to the imf you don't need to go to the mm -hmm. world bank but you need to borrow in order to pay your bills and that's essentially the way that this uh, criminal system functions which is you need to get everybody in debt all the time so that um, they're all constantly borrowing so that they become um, completely subservient to the interests of the money printer that keeps them alive and the secret ingredient for that uh, is the fact that the dollar is constantly appreciating so you need to have a cash balance 
Uh, citizens need a cash balance. Financial institutions, banks, and businesses, they all need to have their own cash balance, and the government needs a cash balance, and the central bank has a cash balance. So everybody's holding on to cash. And in the case of El Salvador, that's all dollars. And in the case of the rest of the world, it's also predominantly dollars. Almost everybody's cash balances are in dollars or in currencies that are backed by the dollar. So you're holding some uh, um, s- some national shitcoin, but what's backing that shitcoin is that the central bank has a big bunch of dollars in uh, reserve. So what's happening as the dollar gets devalued, your uh, holdings are getting devalued. So the things that you need to buy are going up in price. So how can you keep up? How can you buy more of the things that you need? The answer is get into debt. That's how it works. So, and also, you know, and that's what I explained in the fiat standard that the 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 um, the fiat standard just requires you to borrow in order to survive, no matter what your views are about debt. You know, even even Muslims who uh, it's very clear for them that interest lending is haram; it's forbidden in Islam. Most um, religious scholars in Islam today. Um, say that this is okay, that you have to do it, that it's fine because, and you know, I don't want to get into theology now, whether I agree, whether you agree or disagree, whether this is okay or not, but you can sort of see the point because if you're not doing it in a world in which everybody's using this, if in, in a world in which everybody's using fiat money, if you decide that I'm not going to borrow, then you are the bag holder. You're holding on to the cash. The cash is getting devalued. And you are constantly getting robbed. But when you borrow, and that's the key, one of the key concepts in the fiat standard, when you're borrowing, new money is created every time you take out a loan. So effectively, you're benefiting to some extent from the inflation. When you have a negative fiat balance over time, that fiat is devalued. So the inflation works in your favor up to a point. Um, and so it's much better to be on the borrowing side. So there's no way out of this, honestly, except Bitcoin. Orange coin is the only thing that fixes this. And so having the government stack more sats, I think, is really, 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 really important. And I think um, the implication is going to be massive. If El Salvador can get out of debt and they just cancel their national debt, then they just have a big giant stack of Bitcoin that they sit on. And then they cash out some of that Bitcoin and change it into uh, cock bucks um, every now and then in order to trade with the rest of the cock world. Then uh, a lot of countries are going to pay attention. Yeah, a hundred percent. And it, it's it's absolutely so inspiring. I agree. You know, it's 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 Bitcoin is a way out not only for El Salvador but also for individuals all around the world. I want to use the you know the last part uh, the 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 last half of the pod really to talk about uh, your book uh, just released right so you released the the Bitcoin standard then you released the fiat standard um, which honestly say for the, the fiat standard to me I learned so much in that book the Bitcoin standard's like yeah yeah this makes sense the, this makes sense the fiat standard you're just like holy cow, I can't believe people are okay with this. But um, I want to talk about uh, the principles of economics. And this is, you know, you released this as a, a textbook. Um, and there was one part that I that I really want to talk about. Um, and it's the, this concept that time preference is key to understanding money. And what do you mean by that? Because I think that... Um, I think, you know, whether Breed Love, which is a good friend of mine, right? His whole show is what is money? Uh, you ask people, uh, I was on Gary Leland's show like earlier on today, and he was like, What like Nico, what is Bitcoin? And I'm like, what is money? Right. So we kind of like go down this this rabbit hole of what is money. And then your argument is you can't really understand money without understanding time preference. So why is that? And how does fiat play into this? Yeah. So one of the good things about writing this book independently, being out of academia, is that I could just write it with the reader in mind rather than committees of stuffy academics in mind. So I'm not trying to impress academics. I'm not trying to keep my job. I'm not trying to um, get published in prestigious journals that nobody reads. 
which is essentially what academics are doing, which is why they are effectively intellectually neutered because they're writing for research grants and for committees of other academics, which makes them completely unreadable for the uh, you know normal human being with functioning uh, brain cells. So for me, having had the success of the Bitcoin standard, developed the readership of people who read the Bitcoin standard and who are eager to read my new work, I wanted to take advantage of that so that I could write the textbook that I'd always wanted to write, that I'd always wanted to teach, and to write it from the perspective of how do we explain this economics properly? How do we explain economics properly in a way that um, is not out there trying to argue with the Keynesians, therefore buying into their frame? It is teaching economics from scratch in a logical way. And this was really the best thing about um, getting to write this book. And one of the most important ways, one of the most important things about uh, being able to write this book in a um, in a Bitcoin fashion, um, oh, sorry, in a um, in, in a fiat-free fashion, I should say, in a, in a, in a regular Austrian um, logical way, was to be able to explain money and not begin by not trying to explain money by um, you know trying to refute the Keynesian perspective, which is idiotic garbage anyway, but just presenting the Austrian uh, perspective. And then um, uh, building on top of that, because for me, if you approach this topic this way, you understand money as it emerges on a market. You understand economizing in the market, how people economize, how people act, and you understand how different actions. You know, and this is how I structure the book. So I begin by explaining the Austrian foundations of analysis. We look at a human action, value, and time, and then with that basis laid, we look at how humans economize. So I present the ways in which humans economize. We work, so there's labor, there's property, there's capital, uh, there's uh, trade, and then there's money. And that's something that emerges on the market, just like all the other things emerge on the market, because people recognize that using this technology in a certain way allows us advantages. And so you understand the emergence of money on the market, which is very important from the Austrian perspective. And the Austrians are the only ones um, that understand money as a product of the market, because the Austrians are the only ones that are essentially not paid by central banks. You know, if you look at all of the uh, other schools of thought, um, all of their economists get their paycheck from the central bank. And so lo and behold, they all agree <laughs> with the central bank that you can't have money with the central bank. Well, the Austrians don't get their paychecks from central banks. And so therefore they don't agree, or I should say, no, it's not because they don't get their paychecks. They don't agree because they have functioning brains between their ears, and therefore they don't get paychecks from the central bank, and they have to make do with other ways of financing themselves. And that's generally not worked out very well until Bitcoin comes around, and now we have an army of toxic maximalists who will buy my books and um, allow me to work independently rather than uh, work at a university. So another um, ad here, you know, if you want to have me keep writing, make sure you buy my books. Um, so Explaining money as a market phenomenon allows you to understand it so much better than the kind of, um, you know, and then poof, the government says, let there be money, and then we have money, uh, which is the idiotic way in which Keynesians explain it. And so once you understand it as a market phenomenon, for me, it is quintessentially important to understand time preference as a part of this phenomenon, because what money does, the importance of money one, one of the many important things that money does to us is that it allows us to provide for our future selves. Money is the most efficient mechanism for providing for the future. Because in the same way that you know money solves the problem of coincidence once today, money allows me to trade with you and with everybody else because um, you know we don't have to we don't have to trade with one another by finding what are the things that I want and what are the things that you want? And let's find somebody who has what you want and what I have. And then, you know, I need to do several exchanges in order to get to you. We solve that problem by all of us, everybody, um, buying and selling everything in exchange for one good. That's just a very uh, powerful solution to that problem. And so in the same way that it solves the problem of trade on the market and it emerges on the market um, out of human action rather than out of any kind of centralized design. In that very same way, it solves the problem of providing for the future because you don't know what you're going to be needing for the future. You don't know how you're going to be spending your money in the future. And so the easiest 
most effective, most efficient way of providing for yourself in the future is to save money because you save money and then you accumulate it over time. And then money, again, solves the problem of coincidence of once. You don't, you know, you don't know if you're going to need five years from now, if you're going to want to buy a house in um, LA or New York or Chicago or uh, Texas or whatever. You don't know if you're going to be need to be buying a car or which car. You don't know what you're going to be doing. So you don't have to buy everything today and save it for the future. You just buy the money. And then when the future comes along and you need to be spending those money and you need to be buying the thing that you want to do, you just take that money and you um, exchange it for the thing that you want. So it's the most effective way for us to solve the um, problem of providing for the future. And so when we are able to provide for the future with money, that allows us to make decisions about the future more concretely. It makes the future less uncertain. It helps us provide for the future. So therefore, it lowers our time preference. And I make an argument which is kind of, I think I would say original, which is that um, the hardness of money is like a control knob for our time preference. The harder our money, the more we are able to uh, plan for the future, the less we discount the future, the lower our time preference, the more future oriented we become. And then the flip side of that is that when the easier the money is, the more the money loses its value, the hazier the future becomes, the less certain the future becomes, the less we're able to plan for the future, the more present oriented we become and the higher our time preference effectively. So with that in mind, we move on to then, you know, then after I explain money, move on to time preference, I explain this point. Then we discuss uh, money and banking and structuring the book was really the hardest part. I spent so much time moving chapters around and um, changing the way that I'm writing the chapters. The book took me more than four years to finish. Um, and, and the toughest part was trying to structure it. So I moved to explaining money in the market order and then explaining time preference and then explaining um, uh, how the extended monetary system works in a um, in, in a modern economy and that is what allows us to understand the problems of the business cycle why the business cycle comes about and the answer and the reason for that is um when we are able to lower our time preference we forego consumption today and the foregoing of today's consumption allows us to accumulate resources for the future and these resources, you know, they become uh, savings. Wait, wait, and then we can on. use. I'm, I'm going to stop you right there. I'm going to play the devil's yeah. advocate for the sake of the, the conversation. The Keynesian yeah. would say, no, that is bad. We need people to consume or else the world will spontaneously catch on fire. Say, Fadeen, what would your response be to that Keynesian? <laughs> I'd laugh. Um, I thanked myself for the fact that I no longer have to deal with these kinds of idiots because I'm out of academia. Um, and generally, I wouldn't be in a position to respond because, like, I just don't engage with those people. Because, like, how do you, how do you even, uh, why, why would you want to waste your time? Obviously, this is ridiculous. The only way that we can have consumption first is by production. Consumption is unlimited. And the, our desire for consumption is unlimited. You know, it's not like we need to have people consume. People don't need to be given a reason to consume. Everybody wakes up every day, and if they don't consume, they die. So you need to drink water, and you need to eat, and if you don't do that, you're going to die. And um, so we always have an incentive to consume. We need a place to stay. We need shelter. We need clothes. And just the basic essentials of survival necessitate that we have to consume. So the notion that we need to encourage people to consume is ridiculous because reality, nature, um, the the setting and the and rising of the sun, um, our physiology requires us to consume. All of these things require us to consume. And so, but the, the, the tricky part, the difficult part is producing the things that we need to consume. That's the difficult part. And how do we produce? Well, that's what I discussed in the book, as I was saying, you know, we economize by working, we develop property, we develop capital goods, we trade. All of those are ways for us to produce more and therefore generate more output for us to be able to um, to be able to consume it. So the, the 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 constraint is not finding people to consume. 
you know, the, uh, I, I've never come across anyone who um, has a problem of not being, um, not wanting to consume enough. There's always another car. There's always things that we could want to consume. And you could always have better, nicer things. The restraint, the, 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 the constraint is production. And for production to take place, we need to lower our time preference away from leisure and consumption into labor, production, saving, and capital accumulation and investment. And that's that's the tricky part. That's the hard part. So it's easy to say how we consume. And so the Keynesians really have it uh, hilariously backward because they want to say that, no, the problem is we don't have enough desire for people to consume. And so we need to destroy their ability to save in order to force them to consume. And that's idiotic. We don't have to destroy people's ability to save in order for them to consume. People want to consume because they are alive and to live is to consume. You know, every living cell has to consume things. That's what a living thing does. All animals consume, all living things consume, plants all consume. That's not the limit. The problem is the production. How do we make the stuff that we consume? How do we secure it for ourselves? And the answer to that is, as I was saying earlier, labor, production, saving. All of these things require the uh, delaying of gratification. So you can't, you know, we can't just go into the Garden of Eden and spend all of our life laying on the beach and consuming. We don't have that on Earth. Maybe we'll have it in the Garden of Eden, but Earth is not the Garden of Eden. If you're just laying down on the beach waiting um, for food to come to you, you're going to have a bad time. The food's not going to get there. So, you know, you need to go and hunt the food. You need to grow the food. You need to work. And so you need to sacrifice leisure time on the beach. You need to sacrifice consumption goods that you could enjoy today in order to make capital goods that can increase your productivity tomorrow. And that requires the lowering of time preference. So when we lower our time preference, we are able to forego consumption. So we take the resources that we could have consumed, which we want to consume. You know, we never have a problem uh, on uh, wanting to consume. We take the resources that we want to consume and we use them for production. And production is uncertain. It has a high cost because, you know, we're taking consumption goods away but also it's uncertain it's risky it does it might not materialize so you take the corn and you decide i'm not going to eat all my seed corn i'm going to plant some of that seed corn so that i can have more corn tomorrow but you know locusts could come and they could eat the corn and then uh, you don't have any corn tomorrow so your sacrifice went for anything for nothing so in order for us to have production in order for us to have corn tomorrow we need to save we need to invest and we need to lower our time preference but when we do that we get into the process of production and it could work out. And that's how, and, and if it works out, you know, that's good. We have more corn next year than we have this year. We have a better life next year than we have this year. And life continues to get better and the quality of life improves. And that's essentially what civilization is. It's, it's, it's our quest to live a better life tomorrow than we do today, to give our children better life than the life that we have. But the tricky part happens when you know the um, this all goes wrong, when the um, when we suffer from this illness called Keynesianism, uh, or its varieties that have uh, accompanied humanity throughout history, which is that we get these people who tell you, "Hey, you know what would be really neat is if we consume all the corn and still manage to grow the corn for next year." So we're still going to have corn next year, but we don't need to consume. We don't need to forego consumption. We don't need to lower our time preference. We don't need to delay gratification. We can have our cake and eat it too. And that's that's the Austrian business cycle. The Austrian business cycle, the theory of the Austrian business cycle is the controversial idea that you can't have your cake and eat it too, that you can't plant the seed corn that you eat. You have to choose. You're either going to eat it or plant it. And if somebody tells you, hey, you can eat it and we're still going to plant it, they are scamming you. And they're just taking a cut from the corn and then they're leaving you with nothing. And that's, that's I think, why, it's, um, why I liked writing this book this way, because it allows me to arrive at the Austrian business cycle theory. It allows me to explain the problems of the business cycle from the Austrian perspective 
from first principles, because we start off with time preference, we start off with the idea of delayed gratification, with the idea of investment, with the idea of capital accumulation. And then that takes you all the way towards understanding why things go wrong when you don't save and instead rely on consumption. Yeah. And 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 and, and, and it's fascinating. And I and I actually want to, and I've heard you talk about this safe, and I want to ask you, I think that that idea, right? This idea that you know you can have your cake and eat it too. There's entire political philosophies that are built around um this idea that you don't need to work. Um, and they're kind of bait and switched, right? Uh, because really it's not that you don't need to work. It's that the wealth is being redistributed either do uh, either uh, through direct taxation or the more insidious one, which is, you know, the taxation of inflation. Right. Um, and they're very, very strong political philosophies. I would say in the last century, um, you know, they were very, very effective at convincing a lot of people. Um, I'm originally from Venezuela. I went from one of the wealthiest countries in South America, uh, 20 years of, you know, of, you know, uh, let's just be blunt. Uh, you know what? Collectivist ideologies, to put it nicely. Um, you know, it it completely gutted the, the, the country. So on a Bitcoin standard, these very, very popular political philosophies that, you know, have accumulated are very popular in, in a lot of big portions of the world would not be viable under a Bitcoin standard. Um, the, no. the communist manifesto, what's the fifth tenet? The necessity for this for a central bank. If you take that away, um, you can't, it's not really viable. And then that leads me to these would be inherent enemies of Bitcoin. I think it it it, it you know it kind of ends the party. Uh absolutely. So in fact, in fact, I think I you know I wouldn't go as far as to uh, dignify this trash with calling it a political philosophy. Because what it really comes down to, all of these kind of uh, totalitarian ideas, it's no coincidence that all of this trash came about at the same time that central banking came about, because this is just um, central banking propaganda. And this is the scam, the idea that you know we don't have to work, we can just have our cake and eat it too, we can... Uh, we can eat all of our seed corn and still grow the seed corn and have others grow the seed corn for us and we'll still have corn tomorrow and we don't have to do any work. This is what you would like people to believe if you were the guy who was in charge of the central bank. This is what governments would like people to believe. This is the ideology that becomes more and more popular as government becomes more and more powerful because that's what government that's what gives government power. This is what governments want. So these things came about because governments are out there uh, telling people, uh, well, because governments are financing these ideas, because, um, you know, if you look at uh, these leftist ideas all over the world, they are um, very, very strongly uh, promoted at these, uh, at universities. You know, there's a reason why, where you go to any university in the world, you have that mentally retarded, semi-literate German piece of shit, Karl Marx, being taught as if you know he has anything interesting or intelligent to say. And it's astonishing how many people today read his work and they're they're, they're all gaslit into thinking this is what an intellectual should sound like. And you need to read this retard's um, garbage. And if you don't understand it, then it's because you know you need to read it harder. But he was just a moron and. Um, he was a very, very useful moron. He was financed by very rich people. And his ideas were very, very conducive to rich people. Everywhere he went, they were very conducive for central banks and for banks in general, for the, you know, what I like to call the fiat cartel. And uh, you know that's, that's why banks were financing um, these kind of ideas. That's why a government universities the world over financed by money printing are spreading these ideas. Because it is the way to get people to sign on to their enslavement, essentially, through inflation. It's a ridiculous bait and switch where you tell people, hey, you know, we're just going to print money and then everybody's going to be rich. And you print money, you destroy everybody's ability to have wealth, you destroy everybody's ability to save, you destroy everybody's ability to accumulate wealth, and therefore you leave everybody completely dependent 
on their government and then you leave everybody completely um destitute and you know um yeah i mean look at the soviet union look at venezuela look at cambodia look at every single example where that fucking idiots ideas have been tried same thing happens they were promised paradise they delivered hell right 100 million no deaths 100 yeah. million deaths and it 100 and million deaths in the last century only and 100 million and deaths and and it's you could still show a hammer and sickle flag and it, you know it's 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 shown as acceptable and you know if you know the history behind it um it's absolutely disgusting and one of the most hypocritical things too is um is that when they always assume power um they enrich themselves every single time um you know uh so it's like the that's a feature that, that's not a bug like this is what yeah. these people need to understand like if you're a well-meaning leftist if you're and there are some of these people if you're you know if you're not very smart if you're not uh, if you're still in your 20s you could be a well-meaning leftist there are a lot of well-meaning leftists if you are one of those people you know just think about it this way this is not a bug this is a feature this is how this thing works if somebody's out there telling you i need the ability to print money i need the ability to have um the ability to just you know buy anything i want from society they're not doing it for your own good if they wanted your own good they'd want you to have the money to keep for yourself so this is a feature the notion that they're going to get rich and you're going to get poor that's how this thing is done this is how it's always worked out there has never ever ever been any single exception of a system in which and, and, and in the book, I discuss what exactly it is that makes a capitalist system. And a capitalist system is a world in which um, economics, uh, in which capital is privately owned and people can buy and sell capital. So if you have a stock market, you're a capitalist economy. If you don't have a stock market, you're not a capitalist economy. So look at all the societies where the stock market was shut down. And that's what socialism is. So a lot of um, morons like to look at, say, Sweden or Norway or Denmark, tell you that that's the socialism they want. But particularly the American brand of socialism. They tell you, no, no, we want socialism, but we don't want Stalin's socialism. We want, don't want Chavez's socialism. We don't want to have the death camps. We want it, to always have it always ends in the same place, though. That's what people, yeah. people always forget yeah. that. And, and people forget that Chavez didn't uh, promise uh, Stalin. He promised them Sweden as well. And this is what they always the, the promise. They, this is the promise of Sweden. But Sweden has a stock market. Denmark has a stock market. All of these countries have always had their stock markets operating. They were never socialist economies. Um, so they are capitalist economies, and that's why they have the private ownership of capital. And that's what allows them to continue to be prosperous, civilized, peaceful societies. When you take away the ability of individuals to own capital and you give the government the ability to print money, then you end up in a world in which productive labor is punished, insulin, in, um, indolence is rewarded, people just sit at home and do nothing and they um, fare as well as the people who work hard. Nobody produces anything. The small number of people that are at the top, the Chavez's and the Stalin's, benefit enormously everybody else is destroyed this is not because it wasn't real socialism this is real socialism that's a feature not a bug yeah 100 percent. and it, it, you know it's it's so crazy the lengths that the whether it's traditional academia or just the internet um you know it, it they go through they go through uh they go through great lengths to control that narrative to control, um, you know, the the history of socialism, what the consequences of it are. Um, it seems to me that, it, it, unfortunately, a country has to kind of go through it first to really understand. Um, and then the people kind of wake up and they're like, eh. El Salvador had to go through a civil war, right? Eastern Europe had to go through, you know, Soviet Union, right? Um you know, it, it, and it's unfortunate that it has to go through through these things. Now, the thing that I want to talk to you about, Saifedean, is um, clearly it's not a it's it's not a viable political uh, philosophy or economic model. The idea of socialism under a Bitcoin standard is: are we even under, or do we even have a capitalist society here in the U.S.? Is a capitalist society even possible? 
with a central bank is that it, 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 I feel like I, I feel like, uh, you know, it's it's capitalism is succeeding despite the central bank, not the other way around. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think I'd still say that the U.S. is still a capitalist society because the U.S. still has a stock market. And so it's possible for you to own capital and it's possible for you to buy and sell capital. So uh, for all of its uh, bad uh, features, the U.S., Western Europe are still capitalist societies because you have a stock market. That's Mises' definition of what constitutes a capitalist economy, which I adopt in my book. And I go in chapter 12 of the book, I go over several countries and I look at their history Russia, Poland, Germany, uh, Sweden. And I look at how, you know, um, if you look at their history and you use this litmus test, do we have a stock market or not? It actually fits very well with the um, with, with the history of those places that, yeah, this is when they were communist, this is when they were socialist, this is where they um, were capitalist. So I'd say the U.S. is still a capitalist economy, but I would say, as Mises also says, it's uh, a capitalist economy with a, a monopoly on money, with a government monopoly on money, is an unstable equilibrium. Uh, it's a contradictor. It's a contradiction essentially because money is a very important good, and it is one half of every transaction in a market economy because a market economy is built on money. As I was saying earlier, every transaction is exchanged something for money. And so if the money itself is manipulated, it's controlled by the government, it's a pretty unstable situation that's going to likely take you to a place where um, you're going to have, uh, you're going to go one way or the other. And unfortunately, most likely, it looks like it will take you toward the path of socialism. And we see it happening in the US because once the government has control of money, it naturally takes on more and more control of the rest of the economy. It has the ability to buy all kinds of things. It has the ability to influence and control all kinds of aspects of the economy, uh, of society. And this becomes more and more pronounced with time. And the dangerous thing, the really, really dangerous thing is that because um, because capitalist, because uh, fiat money allows governments to control education, as I discussed in the fiat standard, it plants in people's minds the extremely dangerous idea, the extremely dangerous vicious cycle, which is that the answer to a problem is money printing. Therefore, when money printing creates a problem, people are programmed to think that the way to fix this is more money printing, and they're programmed to think that the cause of this was not money printing. So then you get into this very vicious cycle, which is like circling the drain. And unfortunately, you look at the majority of the Western economies of the world today, and you see this dynamic. So whatever problem there is, um, your average uh, voter is out there waiting for their government to solve that problem by essentially printing a bunch of money and handing it out to people. And so that's only going to create more problems, which is going to lead to more calls for intervention. And you also see this in capital markets. And that's really like the, the reflection of this is in the capital market to go back to the original litmus test that I was discussing earlier. You see the reflection, the reflection of this in the capital market in that as you know the stock market has crashed or the mortgage-backed securities have crashed or the government bonds are crashing or whatever is, whichever Ponzi happens to not be doing uh, what the majority of people want, or I should say the majority of people in power want, then the answer is have the government print a bunch of money and prop this thing up. Well, how do you prop it up? You basically buy into it. So increasingly, you see central banks are buying stocks, central banks are buying bonds, central banks are becoming more and more involved in the running of uh, parts of the economy. And so what happens when you do that? Well, that's going to create economic problems. And then when these problems come home to roost, how are people going to tell you you can fix them with more money? So the only stable equilibrium here is either you get rid of fiat money and you go back to free market money and you keep capitalism, or you get rid of capitalism, you keep fiat money, and then you go to communism. So I think this is really where we are right now. And we are being pushed in both directions by different people, different politics, different ideas. Um, but I think Bitcoin is the dark horse that's going to settle this in yeah. our favor yeah bitcoin is is definitely the the great unifier 
Anyway, Seyfedean, I want to be conscious of your time. Uh, please tell everybody where they can find your book uh, that is currently available on Amazon. It's called Principles of Economics, everybody. I also recommend uh, Seyfedean's other books, which played a very, very key role in my understanding. The Bitcoin standard is awesome. But the one that I the one that really resonated with me and really helped me understand the Frankenstein creature that is the fiat money system is the fiat standard. So, uh, Saifedean, why don't you tell everybody? Yes, um, my website, Saifedean.com, S-A-I-F-E-D-E-A-N. Um, there you can buy the book directly, but you can also find all the books on uh, Amazon and plenty of other uh, publishers and bookshops. Uh, not publishers, bookshops, I should say. And um, also on my website, you can find my online courses. There's a There are two principles of economics courses on which this book is based and a Bitcoin uh, standard course and a fiat standard course. So you can take those courses as well. And um, I'm also, I also make my podcast, the Bitcoin standard podcast. You can uh, check it out. And I have my Twitter, Safe Dean. We're always having a lot of fun on Twitter. Come and say hi. And uh, join us as we pile on the shit coiners and the no coiners every day. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're glad and honored to uh, have you on our side. And we're we're fighting in the trenches on the battleground of the Internet for freedom. Anyways, guys, thank you so much for uh, tuning into another se- episode of Simply Bitcoin IRL. Shout out to our sponsor, Swan. Best place to build your Bitcoin stack. And we will see you on the next one. Peace out, everybody.